First off, I do want to quickly apologize about my inadequate definition of pride during my Proverbs 13 teaching from two weeks ago. I know that feels like forever ago, but after further thought and even... Uh, and even some discussion, my definition of pride as perceiving yourself to be of more worth or value than you actually are doesn't seem correct per se. I originally came to that definition from a 1766, you know, like the 17th century almost, um, 1700s, I guess, publication by John Trusler on page 186 comparing the definition of pride with like arrogance, vanity, presumption, and haughtiness. But when I look into the Bible, two of the greatest examples of pride focus on sovereignty, power, or control. Nebuchadnezzar's prideful statement before judgment in Daniel 4:30 says, The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Similarly, Satan prideful, Satan's prideful statement is about power, where Satan said, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That So all that's to say, I'm not entirely certain on the Bible's definition of prayer i'm or of pride i am leaning towards pride is thinking you're in control but i have much more to learn about biblical pride before coming to any conclusion so sorry for giving a bad definition of pride two weeks ago when teaching now i hope this apology also works as a great reminder that teachers are human and make oh, mistakes God, too I ideally believers should be like the bereans who listened to paul in acts 17 11. these were more fair-minded than those in thessalonica and that they receive the word with all readiness uh, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so also believers can rely on the holy spirit to teach them all things John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the teach Father will send in my Jesus' name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So thank you for the listening to that. Second off, I'm having a baby boy in August. My first child. <laughs> I am expecting many sleepless nights, and thank you for the congratulations. And I want to be able to help my wife as much as possible with all, in the midst of all those sleepless nights. So unfortunately, that has become a big reason why I won't be able to teach or even regularly attend VR MMO Church anymore. I'm teaching Proverbs 14 today, and next week will be my last day at VR MMO Church where I'll teach 1 Corinthians 16. I am so thankful for the honor to be able to teach many services for over a year and will remember fondly all the wonderful prayers and questions we've shared after so many of these services. I am hopeful that the Holy Spirit can teach and guide each one of you into what God has called you to do. If you'll let him lead, praise be to God that I have gotten to witness the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, comforting us all here in all our hardships. And all of that for the purpose that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the same comfort we receive from God. So I thank you so much for being a part of all that. Finally, let's just jump straight into chapter 14 of Proverbs, a book about wisdom. Who would like to read for me verses 1, 2, and 3? I plan on shooting you twice. It looks like Zeke is the first to go. 1 and 2. You should Testing be one, on two. megaphone. Yep, Testing you're one, on two. megaphone. Go for it. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with their hands. He who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is perverse in his ways despises him. In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise will perverse him, perverse them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reading, Zeke. 
I'll go ahead and shoot you once to go ahead and put you back on mute. So, and then at the end of service, the, hopefully I'll be able to make sure that all the rolls go back to normal for roll-off volumes and stuff. Anyways, enough logistics. The three, the four takeaways today that I'll be covering in this passage are, one, leave the foolish to reduce your confusion. Two, do not do right in God's eyes, not your own. Three, don't simply believe every word. And four, have confidence in long life through fear of the Lord. So when we're talking about verse one, this verse shows the difference between a loving and self-sacrificing mother and a resentful, selfish, self-centered mother. That's pretty much all I'll say on that. Verse two why does someone with uprightness fear the Lord? Because someone with uprightness has wisdom through the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is the key phrase of the entire book of Proverbs. This whole book that we're reading is about gaining wisdom and says in Proverbs 9.10 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so this, this concept of the fear of the Lord answered a big question in my mind like almost two years ago. What should I do with my life? What should I desire? And I'll very briefly go down that train of thought. What should I desire? Wisdom, according to uh, Proverbs 3.15 and 8.11, which says, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. So how does one, like myself, get wisdom? We can get wisdom through Scripture in Proverbs 2.6. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. We can gain wisdom through prayer in James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Thirdly, instruction. You can, can give, provide, you can learn wisdom through instruction in Proverbs 19.20. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Proverbs. And you can also look to Proverbs 10.31 if you're interested. The fear of the Lord is the fourth and way to get wisdom, according to Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is beginning wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, as we already read. So what does this fear of the Lord look like? It looks like a relationship with God. You have to have a relationship with a person to be able to fear them in the first place. Um it looks more like reverence or respect, similar to that given to a good and loving father. And I've actually found a verse recently, Psalm uh, 89, verse 7, that poetically parallels God's fear and reverence. Uh, I quote, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Now, thirdly, the fear of the of God looks like hatred of what God considers evil. In Proverbs 8:13, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Now, I always want to add this little c clarification, we are to hate the evil but not the evil. Uh, you know, <laughs> because the Jesus says to love our enemies in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. So now I'm in pursuit of a relationship with Jesus through scripture, prayer, fellow believer instructions, and a hatred of the things God hates like oppression. So tying all that back to what we just read in verse 2 is that someone with uprightness fears the Lord because that is the beginning of wisdom and what we should desire most. Finally, moving on to verse 3, where we get to learn about how the rod was a symbol of discipline back then. And uh, correction since the rod would be used by shepherds to redirect sheep. 
So the fool in pride tries to correct others, unfortunately, right? And what's interesting about that is <laughs> that I can imagine how poorly that goes for them when a fool tries to correct others in pride. Other verses describe how what a fool says actually leads to his or her destruction. Proverbs 18, verses 6 through 7, A fool's lips enter into contention, a.k.a. conflict, and his mouth calls for blows, a.k.a. invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. With all that said, can I go ahead and get a reader for verses 4, 5, and 6? Raise your hand. Come forward. Uh, don't be shy. <laughs> uh, we got Everett. I'll go ahead and shoot you. Ooh, you're playing a game of dodge. I think you'll be on Megaphone now. <laughs> Where no oxen are, the trough is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of an ox. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it, but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Thank you for reading. Woo! <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for being so flexible uh, and having a great voice, too. So... Where no oxen are, the trough is clean. This is one of my dad's favorite verses, actually. The ox is big and strong and can do things that take strength. Oops, I did not mean to take a photo, but that's the power of Rec Room. So, uh, the feeding and cleaning. So, ox can, yeah, the ox is big and strong and can do things that take strength. But caring for an ox is messy. The feeding and cleaning is messy, but worth the effort for the benefits of the productive strength of the ox. And that kind of, you can parallel that to the saving of souls is messy and takes time and patience. But the reward of a soul going to heaven is worth the effort. When looking at verse 5, you'll find very quickly that this defines a false witness, someone who lies. Pretty straightforward. Verse 6, being critical and judgmental prevents you from learning wisdom. One of the greatest barriers to truth is assuming you already have it. But those that are forgiving and merciful can learn so much easier. Can I go ahead and get a reader for verses 7, 8, and 9? Go ahead and read. Ah, oh, Everett's ready to do it again. I think you're on megaphone. Go for it. Go from the presence of the foolish man. When you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. Thank you for reading with so much energy. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so fun. So we have reached our first takeaway today. Leave the foolish to reduce your confusion. Leaving the presence of a fool means you will not waste your time. You won't start listening to the advice of a fool, which will cause you confusion. And then don't cast your, you know, like, ah, <sighs> I guess one way to look at that is don't cast your pearls before a swine, right? Matthew 7, 6 is what that's referring to. The, uh, that goes against some that feel it is their job to enlighten those who don't want to be enlightened. It is our job to declare the truth, but it is not our job to get them to understand they can choose whether they want to understand. We can try to encourage. We can try to explain the truth as clearly as we can. But, you know, ultimately, it's their responsibility to understand, to take the time to think it through, to take the time to, you know, believe. Uh, it's not your responsibility for someone else's salvation, you know, if that makes any sense. 
So to clarify, we are to hang out with unbelievers too, right? Uh, hanging out with unbelievers looks like, uh, you know, Colossians 4, 5 through 6. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And also remember, Jesus ate with sinners in Mark 2, 16 through 17. Now, however, this is also a casual reminder that intimate friends should be righteous believers. <laughs> you know, these are intimate friends whose advice you listen to. Proverbs 13, 20 is a good example of it. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Moving on to verse 8, we can find that a fool's deceit is revealed when they talk, and they talk a lot. Proverbs 18.7 says, A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Now, on the flip side, Proverbs 17.28 says, Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Now, a fool mocks at sin in verse 9, right? Um, favor, you know, when it starts talking about, though, that but among the upright there is favor, favor from the Lord is useful. Psalms 5.12 says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. And then Psalms 35 says, For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for Sorry, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Now, ways to get God's favor are learning these kind of wise cheat teachings that we're talking about today. Proverbs 8.35, Proverbs 3.1-4, Proverbs 13.15. The third, second way is to be married, surprisingly, from Proverbs 18.22. A third way... Um, is to be humble, Proverbs 3.34, and a fourth way is being a good person, according to Proverbs 12.2. Can I go ahead and get another reader for verses 10, 11, and 12 for me today? Go ahead and come forward, raise your hand, jump up and down, be excited, um, you know. <laughs> Anyone would like to read? Anyone? Going once? Going, oh, <laughs> Phantomethos, I'll go ahead and call on, um, uh, so you should <laughs> be good. good. The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Thank you for reading. Ha -ha. Long shot. Oh, it says you're on microphone now? Odd. I'll do you one more time. All right. Cool. Continuing on. Verse 10. Uh, it takes intimacy to share in the bitterness or joys of another person's heart. And so, and then <laughs> verse 11 is just pretty straightforward. The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the ten of the upright will flourish. However, once we get to verse 12, we have reached our second takeaway. Do right in God's eyes, not your own. Determining what is right in your own eyes is a phrase that appears often in the Bible. Because, <laughs> you know. Why does that happen? Because Israel was commanded in Deuteronomy 12, 8, that, you know, to you shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Yet, unfortunately, they didn't listen in Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, if you look at Isaiah 5, verses 21, uh, 
all, it also says that woe, aka tragedy, to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own <laughs> sight. Now, why is this so bad to do what is right in your own eyes? It's because you'll, uh, God is the one that makes the calls. Um, <laughs> he decides what is right and wrong, not us. Proverbs 16.2 says, All the ways of a man are pure in his own way eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. So instead of deciding what is right and wrong ourselves, we should fearfully respect what God has decided as right and wrong. Proverbs 3.7 puts it, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, I will tease you, Thunder. I can hear a little bit of feedback, so if you don't mind going into your audio settings and hitting mute, that would be wonderful, or doing what you just did to mute yourself. Thank you so much. I really, really, really appreciate it. So we can also learn that Jesus didn't, you know, like, if, if anyone should do what's right in their own eyes, it should be Jesus, right? Because he's fully God. But yet we find that Jesus didn't do what was right in his own eyes. Jesus prayed three times in Gethsemane for any other way besides the cross in Luke 22, verses 40 and 42, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Ultimately, Jesus' prayer was not answered, and Jesus obediently died on the cross in love. Ultimately, for us, let's just follow Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Can I go ahead and get another reader today to go ahead and read for us verses 13, 14, and 15 over here? Go ahead and raise your hand, come forward, and if uh, you're willing, I'll go ahead and shoot you twice to switch you into megaphone mode. Um, anyone? Going once. Go Jump up and down if you're on desktop. Twice and sold to Phantom Mythos again. Um, I think I'll just right. be one. Good. It says you're on megaphone. Perfect. Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be grief. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. The simple believe every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Well said. Thank you again for reading, Phantom. Wee. Um, so, when we look at verse 14, would you rather fulfill your own fleshly desires like hatred, jealousy, selfishness, found in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, or live a fulfilling life through God's gift of being able to walk in the Spirit? Walking in the Spirit looks like the fruits that are mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. <laughs> Doesn't that sound a lot better than fleshly desires, huh? So don't be a backslider who is filled with own ways, but be a good person who will be satisfied from above, walking in the Spirit. Now, the simple believes all things, right? Um, believes every word. And so we've reached our third takeaway today. Don't simply believe every word. Probably the clearest definition of the simple is right here, in my opinion. They believe everything others say or what they see on the internet, you know? So don't be simple, but be prudent. Be discerning, you know? Don't believe everything your favorite Bible, Bible, bleh, Bible teacher says, even chatters. 
Be like the Bereans who listened to Paul in Acts 17.11. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And then, you know, similarly, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test all things. Hold fast what is good. So I'll go ahead and ask for another reader for verses 16, 17, and 18. Zeke, you're up for it. Lead us away. <laughs> Testing one, two. Am I on? You are on. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a wicked, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much for reading with such great uh, emphasis. We'll go ahead and talk about how. You know, <laughs> guess what? This is probably the first times and probably only times I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Anyone can shout out a guess, especially the regulars. What does the wise fear? And I'm going to realize that all the regulars are probably muted because of the megaphone. <laughs> so I can't hear you guys. <laughs> oh, the irony. Um, so who's read today? Mainly Zeke and Phantom Ethos. I'm going to both make sure that you can talk. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so Wait. any guesses of what does the wise fear here in verse 16? Are you hear Testing one, two? I can hear you, Zeke. Okay. Oh, did Death wise Racer you read earlier? I think you read earlier. Are you talking about uh, fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom? Yeah, you gave the correct answer, Zeke. <laughs> so that was what I was looking for. What a wise man fears is he fears the Lord. And, you know, that's Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But we get to, I get to ask you a second question. This is the last question for today. Uh, you know, and this is a tougher question. Why does the wise depart from evil? Any guesses? Is Phantom trying to say something? No? All right. Well, <laughs> it sounds like we have no guesses. No, I didn't put in my notes on, on the billboard because um, what's its face? I'll go ahead and shoot all you wants to go back to mute state. All right. Uh, so the answer to the, you know, admittedly, it's a tougher question. Why does the wise depart from evil? And in this context, I would answer because the fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Right? So Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the, evil way, in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Now, I always like to clarify, I hate the evil, but not the person, because Jesus says to love our enemies in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. Um, but yeah, so what's what's crazy is, I, I just, th this exemplifies so well a lot of what we've been learning about the fear of the Lord. A wise man fears and departs from evil. A wise man fears the Lord, which is the reason he, he's wise in the first place. And the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, which would encourage the wise person to depart from evil. So you're seeing all the connections between these verses and Proverbs about the fear of the Lord. 
Hopefully that made sense, but I'll keep moving on because there's plenty of content here today. So verse 17, boy, self-control is valuable. We shouldn't be quick to anger. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So when you see another person being getting angry, help them out by using Proverbs 15.1 that says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And then verse 18, simply all I have to say is that because the simple don't discern or evaluate the truth in someone's words, they will fail due to incorrect knowledge. So be prudent or thoughtful to find knowledge that is true. Uh, can I go ahead and get a reader for verses 19, 20, and 21 today? Uh, anyone jump up and down, raise your hand, all that good stuff? Go for it, Phantom Mythos. A little bit of glare from the uh, moon there. Uh, the evil will bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. He who despises his neighbor's sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. Thank you for reading. All right. So, uh, basically, for verse, all I have to say is on verse 21, even though normally the poor is hated by neighbors in verse 20, that doesn't stop despising a neighbor from being a sin in verse 21. So when a person has mercy on the poor, that person no longer sins, becoming much wiser. Now, as you pursue righteousness, think above Proverbs 29.7. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. And then as you invest in riches, don't forget Proverbs 19.17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. And as you desire blessings, recall Proverbs 22.9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. So, give to the poor. Be generous. Uh, can I go ahead and get a reader for verse, verse 22? Do, 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 uh, 23 and 24. Go ahead and raise your hand, jump up and down, come forward if you'd like. We got Mega Destroyer! Thank you for being willing to read. I, I, I don't know if I'm on Megaphone. Is it working? You are on Megaphone. It is working. Oh, okay. Cool. <clears throat> do they not go astray who devise evil? But mercy and truth belong to those who devise good. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. Thank you for reading. Um, breaking up all my monologuing, right? So, simply put... In a similar vein to verse 22, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then verse 23, Don't expect idle chat to produce a prophet. Talk is cheap. And then verse 24, we again, we see that the wise get riches. Um in Proverbs 3.16, length of days is in her wisdoms, right hand, in her left hand, riches and honor. And yeah, so I'll go ahead and ask for another reader for verses 25, 26, and 27. Raise your hand, come forward, jump up and down. We got Phantom again. Thank you, Phantom. We have a lot of verses today, so I really appreciate everyone willing to 
read so much. A true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. In the fear of the Lord there is a strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to, tur to turn one away from the snares of death. Mm, thank you. Thank you for reading. Whee! <laughs> um, we have reached our fourth, fourth takeaway to, for today. Have confidence in the long life through the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, which provides wisdom, also provides strong confidence. Isn't that amazing? That is because people who fear the Lord have nothing else to fear once walking in step with God. Psalms 27.1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Moving on to verse 27. The fear of the Lord also gives wisdom. Um, you know, we already kind of knew that, that the wisdom gives life. Proverbs. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the fear of the Lord gives wisdom, but it, the, that wisdom gives life. So that's why you can see here the fear of the Lord ultimately results in a fountain of life. And I think the fountain of life is referring to length of days, long life, living for to an old age. Uh, the reason for that is Proverbs 3.16 that talks about how the length of days is in her, aka wisdom's, right hand. In her left hand is riches and honor. So... Can I get another reader for verses 28, 29, and 30? We've got Zeke jumping up and down for joy. Whee! There, there I am. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> in a multitude of people is a king's honor, but in the lack of people is the downfall of a prince. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness, rottenness to the bones. <laughs> well said. Thank you for reading. Uh, verse 28, the sign of a good king is that their people grow. Ancient empires recognized that the power of the empire was its population. In those days, the growth rate was considered an asset to increase. So much so, abortions were actually punishable by death, being seen as a crime against the state by reducing its growth. Now, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding is another great verse. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm already on the top one. The the flip side of, and this is kind of like a flip side of what was said earlier in Proverbs fourteen seventeen, which says, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is ha hated. When we move on to verse 30, did you know one solution for envy is the fear of the Lord? Proverbs 23, 17 says, do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. And so that's what you can focus on instead of being envious of sinners. Now, envy will not only rob you of your joy and fellowship with the Lord, but it will affect you physically. So don't, you know, fear the Lord. Don't envy can I get another reader for verses 31, 32, and 33 today? <laughs> Phantom! Yeah! On a roll! 
He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in his death. The wisdom, let's see, sorry, wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding, but what is in the heart of fools is made known. Thank you for reading, Phantom. Uh, you'll notice that in verse 31 that it's <laughs> it's hard to describe how you treat the poor. Re wait, it reflects how much you fear the Lord? Like fearing, reproaching God? Because, you know, if, if, you, if you fear God... You fear the Lord, you will not want to reproach or disrespect him, right? I never realized that. But anyways, so be careful ignoring the poor because doing so disrespectfully disapproves God. Switching to more of a positive note, when you show mercy to uh, the needy, that means you get more mercy in return. Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When we move on to verse 32, the righteous have refuge in knowing that their in that knowing that their earthly death sorry, let me rephrase that. The righteous the righteous have refuge in their earthly death because once they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they know they are going to heaven. Romans 10, 9 through 10 clarifies that process. I quote, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And verse 33, it just, it pretty much makes sense when fools talk so much. And I don't need to reiterate how much fools talk. Can I get well, the last reader for today to read verses 34 and 35? Hey! Thank you for reading. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The king's favor is towards a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. Thank you for reading. Um, so shortly, all I have to say is that uh, selfless, righteous people improve societies and nations. Societies on the flip side wish they could get rid of people who sin against others, you know, do evil against others. Because they're causing unnecessary conflicts. Our conduct affects everyone. Business people and good working enterprises are a blessing to customers, suppliers, investors, employers, and therefore a blessing to the society as a whole. So just keep that in mind that you, your life affects those, your society around you and how you live that will change a lot of lives. The four takeaways today were leave the foolish to reduce your confusion. Do right. The second takeaway, do right in God's eyes, not your own. And the third takeaway uh, for today is don't simply believe every word. And the fourth takeaway, have confidence in long life through the fear of the Lord. I get to give my little spiel, even though I'm pretty sure all of you are Christian here. <laughs> if we need Jesus' free gift of righteousness to live eternally. So I encourage you, seek Jesus. Seek Jesus by having a relationship with him. Pray, read his Bible with instructions so you may gain wisdom and live. Get it connected to it with other Christians who can share what God has done with them and pray with you. So if you would like to begin your relationship with God today with all the wisdom that relationship provides, we have people here who'd be willing to pray with you. Me, Zeke, especially Zeke, who's a leader of our prayer team, 
um, Phantomethos. Now, if you're uncertain, I beg you to pray for God to reveal himself to you. If you've been th- pursuing God for a while, like most of us here, don't hesitate to get prayer for whatever you are going through. We have the opportunity to boldly go before the throne of grace at any time, so don't pass up this opportunity to receive more mercy and grace. Thank you so, so much for coming. And Zeke, would you be so kind to go ahead and close us in a word of prayer today since you're here, since I can, I appreciate your prayers. Uh, did I hit you or did I miss? Because it didn't megaphone. Missing one too? There we go. You are now on megaphone. Uh, there's a camera. God, these in Jesus. Uh, thank you for this wonderful message. I pray this message is reached to everyone, Christian or non-Christian, out in, who is watching this video. May the seed be planted. And may you remember that you are loved by the Lord. Everyone is loved by the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.